From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Politics Hour starring Tom Sherwood. I'm Michael Martinez, sitting in today for Kojo Nandi. We're joined now in the studio by Kathy Lanier. She is chief of the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. she has her gun with her. Ooh. I always have that with I me. know you do. That Kathy Lanier, thanks nervous. so much for joining us. We appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tom and I are going to talk about a, a few local stories before we get squarely into talking about crime in the District of Columbia. But if you want to jump in at any point, please feel free to do so. And Tom, you wrote this week in your column for The Current that this entire year has kind of been one series of one downer story after another. Uh there is, has there probably isn't an organization in the Washington region that's experienced as much downer news as, as Metro this week, and I don't bring them up to, to pick on them. But uh, there was a story this week in, in Washington City paper, a, a Loose Lips columnist, Will Summer, reported about how he had filed a public records request for information about the PR crisis firms they hired in the wake of the disaster uh, near the L'Enfant stop in January when a rider was killed in a smoke-filled train. Mm-hmm. And they provided him with a CD, a CD with unredacted information that then they, they then realized that they wanted it back. They asked for it in exchange for a, a different set of information that did have uh, redacted files. He, of course, said, no way, Jose. It's like trying to re- recall a tweet or recall an email. And in some sense, it does belong into the category of those stories. Like You, you can't make this stuff up. Oh. Uh, but the, my question for you about this is, did we learn anything from Will's reporting about how Metro has been responding to safety concerns that, that are very real that riders still have? And did you find any of this episode instructive about Metro's competency? in handling all of the issues they're dealing with right now. It, it does seem to be that Metro is like a ten-thumb organization. It just seems like everything they do, it seems to be awkward. I will say that, you know, I don't begrudge uh, governments or, or police departments or any organization having a public relations firm. I think they've paid Hill and Knowlton and another firm something like a quarter million dollars. O'Neill uh, and Associates. Right. Uh, you know, it's not for a reason, do like these major corporations, international, they have public relations firms to make sure that their side of the story is getting out. It's only bad if you have a PR firm that obfuscates and, and misleads the public about what's going on. So I think it's okay if you have qualified public relations people trying to tell you how to handle what is a clearly a crisis in management uh, in, in Metro. And it's embarrassing that they release the inside details of what that's all about. But, look, you know, Metro... We had that um, derailment there on the mall. A terrible disruption. Wasn't necessary because they could have fixed it. They knew about it weeks ahead of time. Uh, this just again and again, I talked to Governor McAuliffe uh, from Virginia just this week. He says, we have got to have a general manager in place by the end of the year. We have got to have some shakeup in the management of Metro. We're, it's losing customers. It's seen as not reliable, and it's kind of scary. It has, uh, as the Board of Trade has told us, Jim Denniger says, it is the spine of the entire region where we have 6 million people and growing. We've got to have a way to get people around. We can't have this bumbling and fumbling. And I'll say this. In the meantime, uh, Metro does know that we have an open invitation for them whenever they're ready to make their interim general manager available on the Kojo Namdi show. And I don't bring that up to take the... Dave Letterman trying to book Oprah Winfrey on his broadcast <laughs> by publicly shaming her on the air day in and day out. Uh, that's that's not really my style. But I do think that people who depend on Metro and whose safety and the safety of their loved ones depends on Metro day in and day out, they don't, uh, they're not taking delight in Metro's stumbles. They're as invested as anybody else in making sure that Metro gets it right. And I feel like they deserve to hear from a Metro official it, directly on our show. And I'm going to step down off my soapbox, Tom, because I, I want to get back on it for one more moment. I really want to know more about what the police, I mean, the, the it's a very small force for a, such a huge system. Uh-huh. And I think the bottom line for me is, has Metro's reputation fallen so far that it's not redeemable for too many people? And it, are we on a slow, continuing decline? Or will we see some, some spark in Maryland, Virginia, D.C., political leadership, who I fought over all this, uh, are they going to somehow come in and step up and save Metro from itself? I'm glad you jumped in because I was starting to get kind of worked up and I was feeling it's a little a, bit short. You're the host. You have to be calm and reasonable. Is that what you feel like all the time? 
when you're on the, 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 the soapbox and you're getting kind of worked up? I, I felt like I was on the cliff and I needed to walk myself back. So let's... Either you just you can't have long-winded rants. You just have to have pointed ones. Well, then let's talk about something else. And this is a subject that maybe we can get the police chief to weigh in on. There was a Maryland legislative panel that met this past week about whether changes should be made to protections offered uh, to officers who've been accused of misconduct, this police bill of rights issue in Maryland. What were they looking at and, and what revisions are they considering making to the police bill of rights in Maryland? Well, the bill of rights for police law enforcement officers uh, dates back to a 1969 Supreme Court ruling out of New Jersey that officers had been questioned about their their performance of their duties and essentially were were jeopardized uh, without being essentially read their rights. And so in the early 1970s in Maryland, I think 1974, came this extensive Bill of Rights for police officers that uh, they had up to 10 days they were accused or about to be inter- interviewed for interrogated for something they did as an officer. They have up to 10 days to get legal counsel and then maybe delay even then being interviewed about the event. They uh, Police brutality cases against officers uh, have to be filed within 90 days, and there's a proposal to raise that to a, a year in order to give people time to get over any trauma they've had. And so the police officers have substantial legal protections. It's important to say that police officers have very difficult jobs. I'll say this before the chief does. Sure. They have very difficult jobs. They make split-second decisions that involve life or death. They have to make things, all kinds of decisions constantly. That's why a lot of them quit after 10 years or 25 years. They just don't want to do that anymore. It's a very tough job. But people are now concerned, given this uproar over police officers around the country, that this Bill of Rights for the officers is too lenient. What protections do officers have in, in the district? Is there something similar? So in the, the Bill of Rights in Maryland is, is unique to different jurisdictions. We do not mm-hmm. have that Bill of Rights here. And, I, and I'll repeat what Tom said. I mean, officers have an extremely difficult job, and they should be afforded the same protections that everybody else has in terms of due process when they're involved in uh, uses of force, especially the uses of force that they're put in that situation because of the job we asked them to do. Um, so we don't have protections uh, as extensive as the Bill of Rights, but, uh, you know, officers do have some protections. They do have the ability to um, consult uh, with attorneys and, and with the union, and they have the, the right to have some time before, you know, giving statements and uh, not in self-incriminating statements. Uh, and if there is a, in all of our law enforcement uh, uses of force, there's a criminal review to not only by us, but by prosecutors. So they have to, you know, be assured that they're going to get the same due process as everybody else. That's Kathy Lanier. She's the police chief here in Washington, D.C. You're listening to the Politics Hour. I'm Michael Martinez sitting in for Kojo Namdi today. We're joined, as always, by Tom Sherwood, our resident analyst reporter at NBC4. And let's talk about crime in the district, uh, this past week, we cleared the 100 mark for the homicide rate for the, the year to date. The mayor released uh, a new policing plan, a new crime fighting plan yesterday at uh, an event in southeast Washington at the old Malcolm X Elementary School. Temporary Palmer Malcolm Sites, X or School. Temporary Malcolm X right. School. And there are a lot of people who had trouble hearing exactly what that plan was because her speech was disrupted by Black Lives Matter protesters. It was a pretty rowdy scene. I wasn't there. You were there. And rather than uh, describe that scene myself, why don't we take a listen to it? When you get on a metro bus, when you ride the metro train, when you come to our parks and recreation centers, you should not take your life in your hands. And like I said, I will not be shot at down because I'm telling the truth. Who's with me? Who's with me? Tom Sherwood sounds like it was uh, quite a scene there. It was, you know, it was nearly 30 minute speech by the mayor. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've had two ways of looking at this. On the one hand, this was an opportunity for the mayor to have 
almost a, her sister soldier moment where she stands up. She, she walked into a crowd that she put together. Uh, the chief was there, all council members, community leaders, just ordinary citizens. But they made no effort to stop the people who were bringing in signs that they were waving or anything like that. So I'm just in some ways, as a political reporter, I'm thinking, well, the chief, did, I mean, the mayor did this to demonstrate that she's acting tough in a tough situation. The worst thing for any political leader would be seen as doing nothing or not responding. That's mm -hmm. the worst thing. And so she went there knowing maybe that this was going to happen. She handled it quite well. I think her staff would be pleased the way she did it. She, she first tried to ignore the protesters. Then she tried to reason with them, like, please, you know, listen to me. I'm talking about things you care about, too. And then she tried to shout over them. And so the majority of the crowd there was with the with the mayor. The flip side of that is it's gotten to the point now where the mayor has to do these things because of the crime, has, the homicides, not crime, homicides have scared people. Mm -hmm. When you had a person shot and killed on 7th Street, we had the stabbing on the metro station, we have young people firing guns and innocent people being killed, uh, it raises the temperature, racial and otherwise, in this city about what's happening. And so that's where we are and why we are today to where this weekend in the 7th District across the river, there's going to be an all-hands-on-deck chief. And That's citywide. Is it so? It's, <laughs> it is. City, oh, okay, citywide. Yes. I apologize. I'm going to get the facts right. But also we, we've learned now as today the police union, which has complained about your assignment details and the fact that they didn't get decent raises and other issues, like six or seven different things, they have now the first time ever an, a confidence vote about you uh, this is the first you've had as chief, and they're going to do it through the weekend. The police officers are going to vote electronically. What is your thought first about the, the union getting the police force to have a no-confidence vote? This is your first. Yes, it is my first. You're right. Um, well, you know, I think, uh, first of all, somebody said to me yesterday, boy, if everybody had an opportunity to, to confidentially and anonymously vote about whether they like their boss or not, when they have a field day jumping on that vote, but uh, my boss is great. Kojo is awesome. Right, see a confidential oh, anonymous vote. <laughs> There's the key. <laughs> Although you know, you take it seriously, it, though. You're... I do. I do take it seriously. You know, you know, and I think there's no, you know, there's no secret that we're coming up on election time for the union, and that it's during an all hands on deck. And you know, I, I couldn't even uh, implement an all hands on deck up until now, uh, this part of this year, because of you know, opposition from the union. But, uh, you know, I take it seriously. I talk to police officers every single day. I've been on this department 25 years, and uh, I don't think the union speaks for every police officer, but they are the representation for the union members. So this is their right to, you know, implement their survey and see what the, the members think. Well, what changed, whatever the vote is, I'm, I'm going to guess that the vote is going to be negative. A lack of confidence in you. Maybe I could be wrong, but that's something. You have no guess. confidence in me, Tom. Why no, would you say no, that? No, I'm just thinking that uh, the union likely would not want to have a vote where it turns out they do have confidence in you. That would look kind of funny to the union. But what did you think about yesterday's? Uh, you, you came out and talked to the media after the mayor uh, left, and you thought that she was doing what she tried to do, which is to give a very extensive uh, plan for more officers on the street. Yeah, what is in this work. plan? I'm holding it right here. What is in this well, plan? It's, well, one is to have more officers. You want to answer the officers on the street, and I'll tell you the social aspects of it. She's got kind of five main areas. One is putting more officers on the street and then giving us more tools to help mm -hmm. us protect the residents. You know, we do really detailed analysis of crime all the time and we, because we have to constantly change our strategy. Um, and right now, specifically, the sole crime we're struggling with is the crime of homicide. And largely, that crime of homicide, the spike is in Ward 8 in the 7th Police District. With it's almost up 100 percent. 95 percent. So mm -hmm. um, there are some tools in our analysis so that what we see is that we're seeing a, a dramatically increasing number of people who are out on community release uh, under supervision, um, that are have long, violent uh, criminal histories that are just continuing to commit uh, crime. And so in her f kind of five main points, uh, extra officers on the street, which is overtime, which we have been doing now for a few weeks, mm -hmm. um, giving us more tools. So um, creating some uh, incentives for the businesses and property owners to put cameras up. You know, cameras are a tremendous uh, deterrent, but also significant in terms of helping us close um, closed cases. I mean, it's, it's hard not to get caught on camera these days. 
Um, but giving some incentive for more cameras to be out there on public space. Um, and then making it tougher for repeat violent offenders um, to be on community placement uh, out in, in this, on supervision if they have repeated violent crimes. So. Uh, can, on that specific issue, because I went back in the, the agency that oversees people on parole, uh, supervised release or whatever it is. Right. CISOSA. CISOSA is the nickname for it. I, mean, I was told there are like 14,000 people on parole. Not all of them, obviously, not nearly all of them violent. Might even be a little higher than that. But but not all of them violent people. Correct. But, but there have, I went back and looked at the reports from 2010, five years ago, 2011, four years ago, and from about the gun stat, which is what you guys are supposed to be, this whole city is supposed to be keeping track of gun crimes, who commits them, repeat offenders, keep them off the street. It, to me, it, it sounds like this is not new. It, it's been on the books and in place for years. No, no, this is, the numbers what, are dramatically different, actually. The numbers are different, but the idea that CISOSA, uh, supervisory uh, pro, uh, probation people, are supposed to be aggressively monitoring people who, if they violate parole, they're supposed to be back in custody. Well, this isn't about their monitoring. So because there has been um, a, a you know pretty substantial increase in community placement of violent offenders, you know, there's been, over the past several years, sequestration was part of it, mm -hmm. to house, instead of housing offenders in, in the federal prison system to have as many offenders as possible released under community supervision with conditions of release. So halfway houses, work release, um, GPS tracking, mm -hmm. um, all those conditions. Release. So those people are given to agencies like CISOSA uh, and they have to try and supervise those folks. And so what we're seeing is a dramatic uptick in the number of people that are on community placement for violent crimes, committing more violent crimes. And so what the mayor is asking for is expanded authority for the parole and probation agencies when they go and do those home visits of these repeat violent offenders that are out on community placement, that they can do uh, a search of the living quarters to make sure there are no firearm, illegal weapons uh, in that living space. Now, this uh, is a program that's... Are these surprise visits or are these scheduled visits? Because I can't well, imagine... Uh, this, uh, yeah. The way CISOSA does the home visits now, it's the same kind of thing. They, they do regular home visits with their offenders now and, and this would just add the provision that they would be allowed to um, uh, look for illegal weapons in the in the home now this is a program that's in place in new york and california so this How is not out first. The pe people th the mayor addressed this yesterday saying that there were some reports or somehow uh, can possibly be the media but s suggested that police would be allowed just to go into homes to search for guns. And the that, mayor never said that. That that was no. She didn't say, but she a corrected. Poor, a she poor corrected leak, it. Either a poor leak or a poor uh, read to a leak. Uh, I believe it went out the day before, and really, I know she was trying very hard to try and change what people believed was in the law when we went out yesterday. The protesters who rep under the wide umbrella of the Black Lives Matter um, were saying. The, were concerned about that, that the police, that if you... I think that was their number one concern, right, is they right. had heard that what the mayor was proposing was expanded authority for police to search homes. Uh, search people and search homes um, of people that are out in the community, and that was not at all what the mayor proposed. It, in fact, it's very narrowly tailored to what exactly we see as one of the main issues driving the homicides right now in the ward that we were standing in yesterday. And Tom, if I may, because I, I talked to Eugene... Perrier, uh, who was one of the protesters at yes. the event yesterday, and he ran for the council last year. He was pretty visible at the event yesterday. And he told me on the phone yesterday afternoon that over and above this specific issue, philosophically, where he and the, the people he was there with were upset, is they feel like this subscribes to the general philosophy that more policing more arrests, more aggressive policing is going to lead to safer communities, and they don't feel like that's true. Well, there's two things about that statement. One is the mayor had five main points she was trying to get through. Only one of those points really were for police. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, one that was focused on, um, you know, the criminal justice administration, the system of, of criminal justice. But there was other parts of that that nobody got to hear. And so I have to say this. There's, there's a very delicate balance here is when people in a community don't feel that the police department can keep them safe, uh, and take violent offenders off the street, they start taking justice in their own hands. That's not a place where we want to be. 
We know who violent offenders are, and we need to have the ability to get those violent offenders off the street. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, people will take violence into their own hands. The, you know, that retribution is a huge part of it. So I think it's important when we have what's going on right now in Ward 8 that we have all the tools at our disposal to make sure we stop that. People need to feel safe. And I hear it from people in that neighborhood all the time. But, you know, they may also, uh, as a part of this launch for legislation and all the other parts of this that nobody heard because of the protests, she is, uh, you know, uh, introducing legislation that will take away some of those pretextual stops, you know, removing from the laws on the books about the police making traffic stops for objects hanging from the rear view mirror. Or assaulting an officer. Or misdemeanor APO cases. So she had a big proposal and parks and recs and a lot of other things. Just nobody heard past that initial uh, discussion about the police. Well, I have a follow-up question that came here, a Facebook message I got yesterday from somebody who lives in, in Shaw, and this person asked for their name to be left out of the message. Uh, this person wrote, I'm curious to know if there's any evidence linking the giant floodlights strategy to a reduction in crime. There are now tons of lights outside my window at 7th and O Streets in Shaw. It seems like these problems run deep and more cops slash lights isn't really the answer. I'm also a little bit dismayed at so many of the comments made on the Prince of Petworth site about incarceration being is the answer to our problems. The kid who who has been accused of shooting the American University grad recently at the metro stop by my house was only 19. What he did was terrible, but points to larger structural problems. Where do you feel we as a city may have uh, failed people like him? So the mayor tries to touch on this, too, and she tried to get it in the discussion yesterday. Um, None of us think that the police or arrest are the answer to the problem, right? So there's a larger problem. There's poverty. There's unemployment. There's education. uh, You know, all of those things um, lead to where, you know, we are right now uh, in terms of the people that are committing crimes. And the way the mayor said it, I think, yesterday is, is I, I do realize that poverty and unemployment and education have a huge role in this, but I can't fix that today. But what she has to do today is stop the killing. That's what she has to do today. And so while we all realize there is longer term strategies that have to be in place, we cannot let this go on while those strategies are, are carried out. Okay, let, let me just ask you to go back to the pro- protest for one more moment. I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, And I would like to, do you know what they mean when they say black lives matter? You know, some politicians nationally got in trouble and said, well, of course, all lives matter. But that's not their answer. Do you understand what their frustration is? I do. I do. And, 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 you know, I think one of the frustrations of some of the folks that I talked to that were there yesterday, uh, and one of the mothers um, that was there uh, of a homicide victim said, you know, well, well, my son's life mattered too. And, and my son was black. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know that I felt the same outpouring of support from this group when my son was killed. And so I think there's a bigger meaning for what Black Lives Matter means to some people than to others. So it's getting a lot of attention under the, the Black Lives Matter because of the police involved shootings. But there are a lot of parents that I talk to every day that say black lives need to matter because of the number of black lives that are lost to homicide. We do not have, the mayor said, and you said, we, we have not had the disruption in the police department that we've had in Ferguson, in New York, Chicago, and other cities. And you've gone out of the way to praise the officers because really since the two early 2000s when there were a pro, a city paid out mm-hmm. millions for illegal arrests, essentially, uh, there's been an effort to teach the officers to be more... Um, to calm things down rather than And I have a them. question right here on the line from one Ali in Washington, D.C. Ali, you're on the, the on the air right now. What's your question, please? Yes, uh, thank you. You allow me. Uh, I do have a business in World 8, and I want to thank you first, uh, the chief of police. Uh, thank you. You uh, stopped by and uh, give us the opportunity to talk to you. I was there yesterday, the town hall meeting, that the mayor was talking about the safety and, and I really, uh, and I even saw uh, Tom, so uh, uh, what happened is those people who were protesting, there were quite few, and when I look at them and I, what they are saying is, I don't think they understand, and by the way, I'm an African and I'm black, so, and black life is a matter to me, and every life is a matter to me, no matter black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. So what I'm trying to say is I don't think they understand Black matter is a matter because the mayor, 
she was talking about, but they don't want to hear. They don't want to listen. And they are all of them. They were grown people. They were not teenagers. They came there just to disrupt it and, and, and not to keep the peace. So I'm glad the mayor, she stood up and she gave her delivery across the aisle. And we all listened. I was a businessman. I have a business in Wall-A. She was saying that they need a police force. If they put a more police on the street, what is the problem? That's we all looking to keep the police peace, but Good. they don't want it. And okay, I'm, thank I'm, you for your call, Ali. Uh, and I'm going to piggyback off that with this tweet that we got earlier today from Elise in Southwest. She said, Black Lives Matter activists think more police aren't the answer, but we have to rein in the chaos that allows for higher crime. We need police, but we need them to be model citizens, not aggressive and militaristic, on the beat, on foot, on bikes. Yes, I and I, I can't tell you how many... I had a, a, a woman who called me um, uh, the other day and said exactly that, that she had had interactions with some of the extra officers that were um, deployed out on foot over in, in Woodland Terrace. And then I had a police sergeant who normally is not assigned to patrol but was assigned to that rotation over at Woodland Terrace. And he, he said to me when he saw me, he said, I ran over to grab something to eat from my assignment. And when I was in the store, um, a woman in her 70s walked up to me and said, are you working over there in Woodland Terrace? Are you one of those officers? And he said, yes, I am. And she said, I just want to thank you so much for being here. I know this is tough and I know it's hot and I know you guys are doing everything you can to keep us safe, but it, it it's important to us and we, we're glad you're here. So I think that there are uh, really strong points that if the police officers have an appropriate interaction and their, their presence is appropriate, people appreciate them. If the presence is more zero tolerance, you know, kind of overwhelmingly enforcement related presence, that's not what people want. So we have to balance that in that we have a, a presence that is a good deterrent, that, that engages with the community that doesn't feel like we're smothering them. Uh, that's Kathy Lanier. She's police chief in Washington, D.C. You're listening to the Politics Hour. I'm Michael Martinez sitting in for Kojo Namdi today. Tom Sherwood has a question. Let's go to the numbers about your force. There's a, there, I think the law is you can have up to 4,000 4, officers. You have retirement. You have resignations, uh, whatever reasons people leave, and you're always trying to get up to or stay near 4,000. What is the current number of the force? Well, first, um, there's no law that mandates or dictates or has a minimum staffing number for us. There is budget authority. Budget so authority so 4, it's 000. how much money do I have? Um, okay. And in fact, there isn't right now budget authority for 4,000 because the the bottom line is, is uh, in order for us to have maintained that 4,000, the money would have had to have been put in the budget back in 2009. And unfortunately, 2009 was probably our worst budget year. National recession years. Uh, so 2009, the year that we needed to overstaff police officers so that we didn't have a, a deficit during this retirement bubble, that time has come and gone. So right now we're at uh, 3,840 or so. Roughly and it okay. changes da uh, daily, so about 3,850. Um, the highest we've been at since I've been the chief, the highest number of staffing we've ever had uh, was 4,050. Um, and that was when we got 50 cops funded, uh, federally funded extra officers that were paid through through DOJ. Of, of the 3840 right now, how many are on leave for whatever reason, personal, investigative reasons? How many officers are on leave now? Uniform. See, now the average person doesn't walk around with that t statistic I know, you, but in you're their not the head, average person. You're they, the chief. Tom? Oh, can you have an estimate? But I will give you because I look at it every single day. Okay. <laughs> so oh, you, I, it's a, this is a question Mark Seagrace from Channel 4 wanted to. So you, oh, uh, so you're doing, your favorite, Mark's, doing well, Mark's job again. Doing his favorite So um, if you look at the, all the categories of why an officer would be unavailable for duty, that's what you're getting at, not yes. just leave. But So there's military leave, there's extended sick leave, there's performance of duty leave, you know, injury on the job. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's some non-contact, right? right. So people that are not working uh, usually hovers around, and then we have the Family Medical Leave Act as well. So yes. that's a new, uh, new. We had the original one, and there's a new category that came in about a year ago. So people that are not at work, um, on average, hovers between two and three hundred at any given time, and it does change because the, the Family Medical Leave Act they can do intermittent leave. So you actually have a force. Around 3,600, 3,500 that you can 
deploy. Yes, but the leave yeah. number is always it's pretty up, it's much it's, the same. I mean, it's been the same for many, many years. What does all hands on deck mean So all for hands, the city that's worried? All the all hands on deck is it just means that we have a concentrated effort. Every member of the police department comes to work and works um, out in the community. So if they're assigned to desk jobs r normally on all hands on deck, uh, we're all out here and we're all here, myself included, my hands also uh, uh, over the, usually it's Friday and Saturdays. We do it based on analysis of violent crime. Um, but it just means everybody's out, out in the community. They're walking footbeats, they're on bikes, they're interacting with the community. Um, so it's just really kind of that. It's all hands on deck. Everybody comes out into the community and does the police work that we all put our hand on the swore that we were going to do when we got hired. I want to take a call here from Scott in Salisbury, Maryland, who I think is going to get us to a, another piece of what you've been exploring as one of the potential reasons for the, the spike in homicides we've been experiencing in the district this year. Scott, you're on the air. What's your question? Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to, uh, I guess, to kind of comment more so, the county sheriff in Milwaukee and the Detroit police chief has both credited the drop in violent crime in their district with more law-abiding citizens owning and carrying firearms. Wouldn't or would it be better for D.C. if they relaxed their extremely strict concealed carry and gun ownership laws to allow law-abiding citizens to carry and own firearms and then people who are violent criminals would know you're not essentially shooting fish in a barrel. And, you know, law-abiding citizens wouldn't be owning illegal guns. They would be, you know, only criminals own illegal guns. It would make everybody safer when they knew the person you're going to go rob or house you're going to break into, you might also be getting shot back at. Scott, thanks for your call, Chief Lanier. Thanks, Scott. You know, I hear that all the time. Well, the first thing that you have to remember is first, Washington, D.C. Is, is a little bit unique in that with all the federal law enforcement agencies here in the district, and at any given time, there are hundreds of armed people walking around our streets in plain clothes and suits and ties, and I mean, literally hundreds of... Some uh, like 20-something, 30, almost I mean, 30 police forces you know, of one FBI, kind or another? FBI, DEA, ATF, Secret Service. Uh, Secret Service. I mean, there are hundreds of armed people in plain clothes walking around our city every single day. And we have increased the number of law-abiding citizens that have firearms because we've, uh, you know, increased not only home registration, but also concealed carry. Because the courts made you. Uh, yeah, but what's the, are we seeing this dramatic drop off in crime? And, and I'll tell you, I, I can only talk about the criminal element in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. I see all the time the criminal element in Washington, D.C. targeting homes and vehicles and people with firearms because they're going to take those. I mean, they want that firearm, and they're not afraid. I mean, it, we see criminals engaging in gun battles all the time. They're not afraid uh, to break into a house where there's a gun if they want to get that gun because they're confronting other armed people every day. So you've upped the ante on information to, to find illegal guns that are in the city. Where are illegal guns coming from? What can the department do about it? Uh, this is a, a tough issue for you guys. Well, you know, we... The source, the main source states are very consistent for us. So we look at that. Uh, ATF actually provides a very good uh, trace report for us, and we get it quarterly. So the, the main source states have always been very consistent for us. But what we see is periodically we'll see some, you know, new individual source. So somebody who's running more guns into the district, uh, and we'll, then we'll see an uptick in guns recovered in a particular area. And I think that's partly what we're seeing right now in Ward 8 with the increase in sh uh, homicides over there is these high-capacity magazines. We're finding them uh, in pretty good numbers over in, in Ward 8, and Ward 8 pretty exclusively. So we do believe that, uh, you know, and we're working on a couple of things now, that there is some new source coming directly into that area of the city that's bringing these high-capacity magazines. Can, this uh, surge, and it's not an uptick, it's not a chaotic situation, but it's a sig significant upsurge in murders. And initially, I think the mayor's administration and maybe the police department, too, and initially you guys talked about, well, it had to do with synthetic drugs. No, this is the uh, media's issue. Well, well <laughs> how it was portrayed fairly or unfairly is it might be this and then it might be more powerful guns. And then the mayor has finally now said, it's and you are saying, it's many reasons, it's, but it's occurring in other uh, urban areas and that you don't have a precise reason of why this is happening. So this is why I love live radio and live TV because Can't be whatever I say will not be cut into a soundbite. 
And so in in one interview, uh, when we were talked about talking about a specific case and we say, you know, this person was under the influence of synthetic drugs and we've seen this uptick in synthetic drugs. And then a few weeks later, we're interviewed about a different case and we talk about, well, in addition to that, you know, now we're talking about multiple things that are going on. But whatever we say, we give the long explanation and we get that sound bite on live on on tv uh or radio or we get what some the, tv what the editors put on a written thing we've never ever said neither the mayor or myself said that it was attributable to any one thing and, and it's not only just not attributable to any one thing in different areas of the city there are different issues so nobody has ever portrayed it that way other than the way it's cut up and, and you know put back out there in the are media. there fewer arrests in this city because the police officers are dis, uh, disgruntled you know in baltimore and has there been a drop off in arrest? One person in public safety told me just yesterday he knows any number of police officers and they are just taking a pass on maybe making some arrests that they might have otherwise made. They just don't feel like it's they're doing any good with that. And I've talked with officers who said that the line that they may have drawn for themselves uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago about when they would be willing to engage in something is fundamentally different than it, it it would have been beforehand after everything that's been happening. Well, I mean, surely, and some of that is, is kind of what we want, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think there has been a very clear um, message that, you know, police officers are engaged in a lot of things that can lead to, uh, you know, uses of force that really are not police priorities. You know, you, you have officers that are, you know, out uh, doing child support enforcement and police officers that are, you know, a lot of things that are you know, just not police priorities. And and for the district, the relaxation on the marijuana quantities that you can legally carry, right? So for years, police officers were, were arresting people with small quantities of marijuana and nobody benefited from that. We lost officers on the street in, in an alienated community. And the community has now said that they want small quantities of marijuana to be legal. So you're going to see a, a drop off in arrests. And I think it's a good thing that there are some you know, smaller uh, crimes that, that that officers are choosing not to enforce because it's just not worth that potential confrontation uh, if it can be addressed another way. We did just get this question on Twitter yesterday from Justin Rood. And if trust between police and communities is, is one aspect of what you're facing right now and, and trust with you and your own officers is another aspect of it. This is a question about a, a different partner you have in law enforcement in the district. Uh, Justin writes, some cops say the United States Attorney's Office is too protective of their stats to risk charges without a plea, and they let perps walk instead. Is that true? Well, I can tell you that um, cops and prosecutors will always see things differently. We have, you know, the the standard for the since the dawn of time is police blame prosecutors, prosecutors blame judges, right? So mm-hmm. that's the kind of, you know, the, the cross uh, finger pointing. But I will say that we have asked because of the shift to um, move away from any incarceration, uh, we have asked that the U.S. Attorney's Office look very, very closely when we're talking about violent crimes and individuals that have a history of violent crimes. And that's what the mayor has been talking about. She's not talking about just lock everybody up. Nobody wants that because we can't spread our resources that thin. But what we are saying is that if you're a felon in possession of a firearm and you commit another crime with a firearm, you should be charged with the felon in possession. What does not- the U.S. Attorney Vinnie Cohen or his staff say to that? Well, you know, we've had a lot of these. So some of this is is not a conscious decision by the U.S. Attorney's Office to try and undermine the police department. I think some of those um, plea agreements that have been made in the past, there's a variety of reasons why they make plea agreements. You know, it could be because it's a case that doesn't have strong forensics to back it up. It could be because they have a lack of resources to take every single case to trial. So all we've really asked is, is that the prosecutors right now, for us in Washington, because of the numbers that we see, to please, you know, look very carefully at violent offenders when they come into the system with a new violent crime arrest uh, and have a history of violent crime, to please make sure that those cases are not being pled down and are not being, those people are not being released. Can, uh, let me uh, get into, earlier in the summer when we started seeing the surge, uh, a number of people uh, said that there was friction between you and the mayor, that the mayor, who's the political leader, was concerned that the the force, you and the force, were not doing enough to demonstrate that you were reacting directly. Now, yesterday, in a, in a couple of times, 
she's given full throat of support for you. Was there some initial uh, um, friction between you and the mayor about what to do at the beginning? Now you're on the same page, or are people making that up? Well, people make stuff up. I mean, I have a great relationship with the mayor. The mayor has been, you know, I, I know her. I've known her for many years, so I know her philosophy. She knows mine. Um, there's never been any friction, at least in my opinion, there's never been any friction between the mayor and I. We've kind of operate on the same wavelength, that there are times when you have to be strong about what it is the police department's got to do. And you heard it from her yesterday, I think better than I can say it. Um, she feels the same way that I, that I think law enforcement feels, that there are times when you've got to draw a line in the sand and say that there, we've got to focus our efforts to stop what's going on right now, and then we can work on the longer-term stuff. The union says one of the, that focus is misplaced because you've consolidated units that used to be spread around the city, and so they're less, in the, they're less often in the very neighborhoods because they're more consolidated in some kind of bureaucracy that keeps them from doing more of that. And you said that's an outdated idea, but they, they, that's part of the reason they're having their confidence vote. Yeah, I mean, uh, change is that nobody hates change more than police officers. Trust me, I'm a cop, and I feel the same way. Well, let's take a question <laughs> about what uh, what your officers are, are doing or not doing from Donald in D.C. Donald, you're on the air. Go ahead. Not the Donald. Hey, how you doing there? I was beginning to think you weren't going to get to me. Not that Donald. I want to talk about community policing. Um, huh. I don't understand how so many officers... <laughs> During their community policing, you'd see three or four cars sitting there with the officers inside talking to one another as opposed to getting out talking to the community. I've seen this since she implemented this community policing policy over a month, two months ago. Officers sitting there, everybody's parked, facing different directions, everybody's talking to each other. No interaction with the community, no getting out, walking, talking to people. So... I don't know if there's a sergeant that's responsible for going around seeing if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, or they just, the sergeant just doesn't care, he's taking part in the conversation. I don't know. But I'd like the, the chief to address that, please. All right. Thank you, Donald, for your call. Chief good question. Him. Thank you. It is a good question. Um, well, first of all, the, the community policing you, you said that started about a month or so ago kind of got my attention because we've we, 20 years ago yeah and, and and literally in 2007 we pushed out 300 permanent foot patrol assignments with the you know the idea that we really were going to be engaging so we pulled away from the zero tolerance hot spots policing and put these foot patrol and bike officers out in the community and uh so I will say this, if you see something that, that like that, what you just described, and you don't think that it's proper, or if they're sitting there for periods of long periods of time. Now, I know that officers and sergeants will meet in areas to have sergeants sign police reports and things like that. That still has to be done. And they, they also are allowed to take a 30 minute break every day. Um, but if you see officers and sergeants uh, in cars like that, that are not engaging with citizens, or they're sitting in a place for a long period of time, you certainly should reach out to make sure that the supervisors and that, you know, are aware so that we can address that but it's not always what it appears but you know we do have officers going door to door as well knocking on people's doors introduce themselves and, and i get lots of good feedback about that i have a question that i want to go back to something we talked about briefly earlier and that's this new uh initiative the, the incentive program for businesses and homeowners to install cameras and share video with police that the mayor talked about it yesterday how's that going to work so we already have a program in place now where you can uh, go onto our website, and if you have cameras that you want to you want to share with the police department, you can register the camera. So two things we want to know is um, because so many people have cameras now, especially in the private in the private cameras, um, where cameras are, we map them on a map. So when a crime occurs, we can look at that map and say, okay, there's 10 cameras in this one block area that we need to go and and see if we can get access to. But also allowing people to get, grant us access to their cameras. A lot of the cameras are web-based or we can connect with. So we do that with businesses. Castle Security actually donated a thousand cameras uh, through Castle so that we could connect mm -hmm. with the uh, users of the Castle cameras. Um, so we literally have access to a lot of cameras around the city. If we don't have access, just knowing who has cameras, so if a crime does occur, we can come and ask for a copy of your, your video. So what the mayor wants to do is just offer some sort of incentive. So um, maybe smaller businesses or, or churches or some some others, you know, who can't afford a lot of expensive systems can get some sort of rebate for that. Where I'm sure we you get one last question. Where are we on police cameras? I know that you have to reach some agreement with the council on what's going to be available for freedom of information. 
and you still would. You talking about body cameras? Body cameras. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got body cameras out in five and seven D right now. Uh, once we get through the regulations and the next round of cameras comes in, which should be in the beginning of the fiscal year, so Octoberish, uh, we'll continue to roll them out, uh, two hundred per district uh, through all seven districts. Uh, okay, one. I have one more quickly. Go you've, for been, it. you've been on the force since the early nineteen ninety ninety one. You've been the chief for eight years. You've been endorsed by the mayor and, and fairly popular. What's your own expectation? Uh, Kaya Henderson has said she wants to stay through 2017 to run the school system. Do you have a timeline you've shared with the mayor or anyone or us? Uh, no. <laughs> that was simple. his second question. <laughs> well, you know, it's a tough job. You've got to be personally uh, stressed like the mayor is on all the crime that's occurring now. You've well, seen you, a lot of But, you know, my stress comes in different ways than most people. My, my stress is when I, when I have to go to crime scenes and, and see families uh, and we have the, the number of murders that we're having. So my stress is at the scene when it happens, not, you know, the way everybody else would expect it to be. Uh, once I get past that, it is now determination to stop that <laughs> more than stress. That's a good question, Tom Sherwood. And... Uh, we're about to, to wrap up today, but you got time for one last one if you want one. Why do you keep giving him extra questions? <laughs> because he's good at it. <laughs> he is. <laughs> How much, there's not much, you mentioned in 70 or whatever it is, 95% increase in homicides. A lot of this of public attention didn't happen until there was a racial aspect where the white guy got killed at 7th Street and the white guy got stabbed on the metro. Is there a racial, you're a white person, I'm a white person, is there a racial aspect of this that we ought to be more aware of? And you got about 20 seconds. You probably are not going to like my answer, but, um, you know, I have complained repeatedly, like the members of the community have complained, is that not all homicides get equal coverage by the press. And when they don't get equal coverage by the press, it gives the impression that they people don't care as much. And we we try very, very hard to get Charney's Milton lots and lots of coverage. And that homicide did not get the same coverage as some of the others. That's Kathy Lanier. She's police chief for the District of Columbia. Kathy Lanier, thank, thank you, you so much for making time for us. Tom Sherwood, resident analyst, reporter for NBC4. Great to see you as All always. Right. We'll see you back in a week and a half. I'm Michael Martinez. I've been sitting in for Kojo today. Thanks so much for listening.